Hello everyone, so as many of you may be aware by now, there is a proposal for a law here in the UK that will ban porn unless you specifically opt into it when you set up your internet. Dylan and Cole did a very good video on this very subject and I'd been planning to do a video myself on the porn law. My willingness to make my version of the video was slightly scuppered when he made his, but I have decided to go ahead and make it anyway because I do go in a slightly different direction, although I do come back and sum it all up within the context of the porn law at the end. So basically, as I said, there is a proposal for a law here in the UK that will ban porn on your computer unless you specifically opt into it when you set up your internet. Now, I first became aware of this story when I watched a Young Turks video on the subject, but I figured it wouldn't be very likely it would pass, and as I was um, checking the BBC News site, I came across a headline that said, Internet porn block not possible by ISPs, as I suspected. And it's basically an article which includes a lot of people within the industry saying it's not doable really, it's unfeasible and it's silly, it's not going to work. This is aside from other objections to it brought up by people like Dylan Nicole and the Young Turks, such as the fact that it's fundamentally just a very illiberal thing to do. There's also the issue of what exactly constitutes porn and, you know, the problems that will be incurred through that. And I think Anna Kasparin from the Young Turks brought up a point which I think was just funny more than anything, wherein it leaves you in a situation, if this law would be brought in, if it was passed, uh, where if kids search for porn on their <laughs> on their internet, if they watch colour, get it blocked, they know that their parents have, have decided not to have porn on their computers. But if they get through to the porn, the kids will then know that their parents specifically asked for porn on their computers. And obviously that's kind of gross. So the ISPs were saying it was unfeasible and it'll be ineffective, there'll be loads of problems enforcing it. And this article has a comment from Jim Killock, chair of the Open Rights Group, who says this is not about pornography, it's about generalised censorship through the back door. This is the wrong way to go. If the government controlled a web blacklist, you can bet WikiLeaks would be on it. Let's leave that right there and move on. Let's not talk about WikiLeaks here. So yes, you also have people from digital rights groups saying that this is just something that's incredibly illiberal, that shouldn't be happening in the UK. But as I read, I came across a woman called Miranda Suit, co-chair of Safer Media, who supports this law. Miranda Suit, co-chair of Safer Media, which campaigns to make media safe for children, told the BBC that the pornography available on the internet was qualitatively and quantitatively different from any that has gone before. This porn is different. This porn has mutated into something far more malignant than we have ever seen before. We are not ready for this kind of porn. Mrs. Suit cited a report compiled by the US conservative think tank, the Witherspoon Institute, which suggested that easy access to pornography was damaging some young people. Miranda Suit goes on, children are becoming addicted in their teens to internet pornography. They are being mentally damaged so they cannot engage in intimate relationships. What we are talking about is censorship to protect our children. Oh, fucking hell. Whenever you hear someone say, what about the children? Slap them around the face. I hate that fucking argument. Protect the children. That's basically just a way to try and legitimize taking away people's rights. Hey, this is fucked up. Why are you taking my rights? The children. Well, that's debatable, but you don't you care about children? Ugh. So I decided I would go onto Miranda Suit's Safer Media website and have a nosy around and Boy, did I find a treasure trove of fail. Let's go on to the Safer Media website, which is incidentally called Media March at the moment because it was Media March, now it's Safer Media, and they haven't updated yet. Welcome to the Safer Media website. Until we have a new website, our previous name of Media March will also appear. Please take your time to explore the new website and learn about our vision. That's the welcome page. If we go on to what is Safer Media, we get a much more in-depth description of what Safer Media is. Safer Media is a charity seeking to reduce the harmful effects of the media on our children, families, and society. The portrayal of explicit violence, sex, and bad language are becoming normalized as mainstream fare, but research suggests they are partly to blame for violent crime and antisocial behavior, family breakdown, pornography addiction, and sex crime. Our dream is to see the media influencing people positively and helping to create a safer and happier society for everybody. Help us get the message across to individuals, parents, the general public, the government, and the regulators. We engage in raising awareness, educating and supporting the public, monitoring the media, highlighting relevant academic research, and lobbying. Join us in working together for better protection of our children and vulnerable adults, better media regulation, and stronger obscenity laws. <laughs>
Let's move on to our objects and aims. Our objects and aims. The protection of good mental and physical health, in particular of children and young people, by working in accordance with Christian values. To minimise the availability of potentially harmful media content displaying violence, pornography and explicit sex, bad language and antisocial behaviour and the betrayal of drugs. It goes on a bit after that, but did you notice that they say that they are working in accordance with Christian values? So this is a religious Christian organisation that is trying to lobby against individual digital rights. Now to be fair, just because someone is a Christian, it doesn't mean that they're an idiot or a crackpot or that they're all trying to destroy freedom and we can't just say, well, she's a Christian, so all her opinions are invalid. We can't do that. That's not particularly fair. So we'll give this filthy Christian the benefit of the doubt and move on to what I think is the most interesting part of the website, wherein they try and justify their beliefs about uh, media content by trying to prove a link between things like video game and TV and film violence and pornography with damage to people. Basically, video games, TV, porn, are gonna come into your house, kill you, rape your dog, whatever. This section is titled, The Link Between Media and Crime. There's quite a lot to go through in this section, so I'm gonna try and be quite quick. So here we go, the first thing that Safer Media brings up <laughs> in their section of their website entitled The Link Between Media and Crime is the Derek Bird shooting. If you don't know, and I hope every single person from the UK knows about this, but maybe people around the world might not. Earlier on in the year, in June 2010, there was a man called Derek Bird in the county of Cumbria who went on a killing spree. He got a gun and shot a lot of people. And it says here, the debate over the effect of violent films looks set to be revived after reports emerged that Derek Bird watched the grisly Steven Seagal film on deadly ground hours before embarking on a shooting rampage last Wednesday in which he killed 12 other people and injured 11. They're quoting from a Guardian newspaper there wherein they're trying to link Derek Bird getting a gun and shooting 12 people with a Steven Seagal film. The 1994 film, which Seagal directed and starred in, centers on an environmentalist oil rig worker who, aggrieved after he learns faulty equipment is damaging Alaskan wildlife, goes on a murderous rampage against his co-workers and employees. The film, banned at the time, but now something of a cult favorite, involved multiple scenes of graphic violence involving a range of firearms. Now, first of all, it says there that the film On Deadly Ground was banned at the time. If you go onto the BBF website and look up the film On Deadly Ground, you will find out that the film On Deadly Ground by Steven Seagal was never banned in the UK. Not once. Not ever. One minute and nine seconds was cut out of it, but it was never banned. Apparently it was banned in Norway. Not sure. But it was never banned here in the UK. And it was definitely not a cult favourite. If you go onto the Rotten Tomatoes website and look up On Deadly Ground, you will not find one fresh ripe tomato in the lot. All the reviews for this film are absolutely horrible. That's not even the point though. She's trying to link a Steven Seagal film with Derek Bird, the guy who went out and shot 12 people. So apparently Steven Seagal films make you want to go on a murderous rant. Actually, that makes a lot of sense. Kidding, kidding. That's absolute bullshit. Does anyone really believe that if if Derek Bird watched On Deadly Ground with Steven Seagal in it, that motivated him to kill 12 people. Seriously? There is then a list of supposed cases wherein people have watched or consumed violent media content and then have gone out and killed people, but every single item on this list that I looked into was clearly way more complicated than someone just watching a TV show and then fucking killing someone. Let's have a look at a few. Jane Longhurst murdered in horrific circumstances by a man who had been viewing violent pornographic sites. If we look this up, however, we see that it is a man who has killed a woman by strangling her, who had apparently been watching violent pornography. Turns out he'd been engaging in the practice of autoerotic asphyxia five years prior to actually encountering any of the so-called violent pornography. And he said that he'd had violent thoughts towards women since he was 15. So does it sound like he watched that porn and then just went, oh, I'll kill someone? No, it doesn't. Next on the list is Stefan Pakira, murdered by another teenager who was obsessed with the ultra-violent video game Manhunt. If you look into that case, however, you'll see that the police dismissed that as a motive and instead concluded that the real motive was drug-related robbery. Zahid Mubarak, beaten to death by another inmate at Feltham who had just watched a violent video. Now, I had a look into this case and I literally could not find any reference to the man who murdered Zahid Mubarak and Mr. Robert Stewart watching any violent video. On the Safer Media website, it just says that he watched a violent video 
video. What does that mean? And I couldn't find any reference to it whatsoever. However, if you Google the name Zahid Mubarak, the first heading that comes up is Asian youth murdered by psychotic racist in British Young Offenders Institution. Yeah, that definitely looks like it's a case of someone watching a violent video and then killing someone. Got nothing to do with racial hatred. <laughs> What a silly proposition. I actually have found a quick biography on Robert Stewart, which goes like this. By the time he arrived at Feltham in West London, Stewart had 18 convictions for 70 offences. But it was during the early stages of his imprisonment in 1997 that his behaviour rang alarm bells. On one occasion, he flooded his cell, smeared excrement on the walls, covered himself in margarine and placed a noose around his own neck. Later, after being mistakenly told he was to be released, he was found talking to the cell walls. The following month, he was seen eating soap and swallowing a screw. He later set fires to his trousers that he was wearing. A nurse recorded Stewart and another prisoner inciting each other to harm themselves. Yeah, this really sounds like a guy who just watched a video and then killed someone. Moving on to James Bulger, murdered by other children whose overriding pastime was watching violent videos. Now, if you don't know already, the case of James Bulger, or Jamie Bulger as he's more well known, is quite... Quite a significant one within the area of media studies and effects. Jamie Bulger was a kid who was kidnapped by two older children who tortured him and then killed him. And there was a massive moral panic around the fact that apparently the two kids that had done this had watched a film called Child's Play 3 and had got the idea to splash paint in Jamie Bulger's face. Apparently, Jamie Bulger's killers had watched Child's Play 3 and had then decided to murder a kid. However, there has never been one shred of evidence that suggested that Jamie Bulger's killers had ever even watched the film. The police even said that it was literally unlikely. But because of the way that moral panics work, it just turned into a shitstorm of, oh, kid watches violent film and then kills another kid. Despite the glaring lack of evidence that these kids had even watched the film. Last on the list is the women who were raped and murdered by American serial killer and porn addict Ted Bundy, executed in 1989. This is an interesting one. If you don't know about Ted Bundy, already. Come on. Ted Bundy was an American serial killer who it is generally estimated killed around 35 women. Because of some of his comments about his usage of pornography, some people tried to make the link between him watching porn and then killing 35 women. But before he was executed, he was actually interviewed by James Dobson, who is the founder of Focus on the Family. That lovely organization. Obviously, Focus on the Family is not a particularly porn-friendly organization, but he did interview Ted Bundy, and Ted Bundy said this. This is his literal words. This is exactly what he said in this uh, interview with James Dobson. Before we go any further, it is important to me that people believe what I'm saying. I'm not blaming pornography. I'm not saying it caused me to go out and do certain things. I take full responsibility for all the things that I've done. That's not the question here. The issue is how this kind of literature contributed and helped mould and shape the kinds of violent behaviour. So clearly that suggests that Ted Bundy did believe that the pornography he had watched had affected him in some way, but he said specifically that pornography had not made him go out and kill 35 women. Clearly, Ted Bundy was just a little bit more fucked up for him to just watch some pornography and then go out and kill people. So that's just some of the things off of that list. But we move on to some research on the effects of media violence. In this section, Safer Media is obviously trying to link uh, violent video games and violent TV and films with violent children. I.e., violent video games and violent films will create violent children. Of the two studies cited on the Safer Media website that I could actually find and look at for myself, the first one was called Television Viewing and Aggressive Behaviour During Adolescence and Adulthood. However, in the study I did find this interesting quote. It should be noted that a strong inference of causality cannot be made without conducting controlled experiment, and we cannot rule out the possibility that some other covariates that were not controlled in the present study may have been responsible for these associations. The second study cited is called Television Violence and Behaviour, a research summary. However, under the heading Research Findings in that study, it says this. While few would say that there is absolute proof that watching television caused aggressive behaviour, the overall cumulative weight of all the studies gives credence to the position that they are related. Essentially, television violence is one of the things that may lead to aggressive, antisocial, or criminal behaviour. It does, however, usually work in conjunction with other factors. As aptly put by Dor and Kovarik, television violence may influence some of the people, some of the time. So, if you already have a person or child who is already kind of fucked up, kind of hostile, kind of antisocial and aggressive, watching violent TV and playing violent video games isn't going to help. But a normal kid is not going to play on Call of Duty or Grand Theft Auto and then go out and murder everyone they can find. CONTEXT, MIRANDA! Taking things out of context seems to be a running theme with people who are trying to link violent video games and violent kids. Just to illustrate that, let's look at an article called The Impact of Video Games on Children. It says, in another study conducted by Gentile, Lynch, Linda and Walsh, adolescent girls played video games for an average of 5 hours a week, whereas boys averaged 13 hours a week. The authors also 
also stated that teens who play violent video games for extended periods of time tend to be more aggressive or more prone to confrontation with their teachers, may engage in fights with their peers, or see a decline in school achievements. But if you go and actually look at the study, it says this. It is possible that the people who are most affected by violent media are those who are naturally aggressive, thus putting the most vulnerable at the greatest risk for increased aggression. There have not been very many studies designed to test this hypothesis, nor have the results been consistent. The present research found no interaction between trait hostility and exposure to video game violence. Instead, an additive effect was found such that a combination of high hostility and video game violence places an adolescent at an increased risk of higher levels of aggression. And I actually found a quote from one of the guys who authored this study, Dr. Douglas Gentile, who is a developmental psychologist and is an assistant professor of psychology at Iowa State University. He says, the conclusion I draw from the accumulated research is that the question of whether video games are good or bad for children is oversimplified. Playing a violent game for hours every day could decrease school performance, increase aggressive behaviors, and improve visual attention skills. Instead, parents should recognize that video games can have powerful effects on children, and should therefore set limits on the amount and content of games their children play. In this way, we can realize the potential benefits while minimizing the potential harms. So this is a guy saying that there are admittedly negative effects associated with violent video games. But first of all, it isn't as simple as kids playing a violent video game and then going out and killing people. Studies suggest that if you have a hostile, aggressive child, video games will only be one factor among a myriad of other existing factors. So basically, again, a healthy, happy, well-adjusted child is not going to play on Call of Duty and then kill someone. Under the heading, some research on the effects of sexually explicit media content, they only give one study, a meta-analysis of the published research on the effects of pornography. Again, I went to look at the actual study and found this quote. While likely not a solitary influence, it appears that exposure to pornography is one important factor which contributes directly to the development of sexually dysfunctional attitudes and behaviours. Bearing in mind that this was a study done by the National Foundation for Family Research and Education, which is part of We Care To Canada, which is a Christian evangelical organisation. Now again, we can't just dismiss someone because they're Christian, but this study admitted that it's not the only factor. Healthy normal people are not going to go out and commit sex crimes because they watch porn. It's a bit more complicated than that. So rounding all of this up, with Safer Media using existing studies to try and prove a link between violent video games and TV and films and violent kids and pornography and sexually explicit media content and sexually deviant kids, I guess, we can see that the studies themselves do not say that. They say that in most cases, these will only be contributing factors. In other words, people who have problem with violent video games, violent TV and films, and pornography almost always have other problems associated with them. Again, violent video games and TV and films and pornography is not going to wreck your teenager. Now I realise that's been a bit of a mouthful, so just for kicks, let's check the link section of the Safer Media website. The funniest one I found was Celebrate, a site celebrating celibacy. Say that ten times fast. The funniest bit I found was the Celebrities section. Many well-known people, past and present, have chosen to forsake sex in favour of other pursuits, most of them going on to achieve great things in their respective fields of expertise. Here are just a few below. First on the list, J.M. Barry, author of the children's classic Peter Pan, is rumoured to have been asexual. Yay! Second, scientist Sir Isaac Newton is rumoured to have spent his entire life as a virgin, preferring instead to concentrate on his experiments and research, thus channeling his energies to a higher cause. Hey kids, wanna be a virgin your entire life? Yeah! Third on the list is Natasha Bedingfield. Multi-talented singer-songwriter Natasha is a Christian and has been successful without having to sexualize her image or her lyrics. But one of the funniest parts of this entire site is the news section, which includes information on Britain's oldest virgins, but also this hilarious nugget. December 2009, Joe McKeldry proves himself a role model. Teenage heartthrob Joe McKeldry, who just stormed to fame as the winner of the UK talent show, The X Factor, has said that he has no time for girlfriends. He says, I've had girlfriends, but I don't want one now. I haven't slept with anyone, but I'm a young lad and I'm concentrating on my music. I know I'll probably get offers, but for me, it's it's all about the singing for now. He added, being recognized means you have to be really careful. I say, enjoy it, but don't go over the top. At the minute, the last thing on my mind is a girlfriend. Hmm, I wonder why the last thing on Joe McKeldry's mind is a girlfriend. Anyway, getting back to the actual point of this video. Through all of this, I hope you have learned that there is no absolute link between adolescents watching violent TV and films and playing violent video games and then becoming axe murderers. Nor is there any absolute link between adolescents watching pornography and becoming emotionally stunted rapists. But even if there were some semblance of a link, the proper way to deal with this problem is good parenting. Exercise 
exercising due diligence and sound judgment with your children. This is aside from the fact that all the experts are saying that the proposed alternative, i.e. censorship, wouldn't work. So we come back to Miranda Suit, director of Safer Media, which is trying to protect children from the ill effects of violent media content. Even though the cited research that they give is taken out of context, and the examples of media violence causing real-world violence are feeble and tenuous. Well, just over a month ago, Miranda Suit wrote an internet article for the conservative newspaper the Daily Mail. Throughout it, she goes through all the things I've already talked about. How media violence causes violent kids, and how pornography will stop children from ever forming healthy, intimate relationships. As I've pointed out, all the evidence suggests that in the case of people who are being affected by violent or sexually explicit media content, already have existing problems. The media is not wrecking the youth of today, and if your child does indeed have problems with violent media content or sexually explicit media content, the best way to deal with it is by good parenting, not by allowing the government to restrict every everyone's access to it. Her response to the radical idea that it is the job of the parents, not the government, to raise children is as follows. Many parents are simply not familiar enough with computers to detect when their children have visited such sites. And even if they know how to apply the filters to stop them, these are far from 100% effective. So, because a lot of parents aren't tech savvy, BAN PORN FOR EVERYONE! For God's sake, you can't infringe on people's rights because of the failings of others. And if you don't know how to stop your children from watching porn, fucking learn! That's part of being a good parent! You can't say, oh well I don't know how to work this computer! Better get the government to block all porn for everyone! Ah! So in the end you have a law, this porn law, that is suggesting that we ban porn at the source unless you specifically opt into it, that is being criticised by ISPs for being practically unfeasible, and by digital rights groups for being entirely illiberal. It is however being supported by people with a religious motivation and no concrete evidence to back up their claims. So aside from the simple feeling that I have to address bullshit whenever I see it, this is a stupid law. Along with that, it brings up issues of media effects on children and moral panics. And no matter how hard people try to prove that violent video games, violent TV and films, and pornography are destroying our nation's youth, they will fail because they aren't. And I'm just so sick of the discussion, especially with video games being between people who work within the industry, who know about video games, who play them themselves, and people who are entirely ignorant, know-nothing, moral crusaders, like Miranda arsing suit. So number one, this is a stupid law. It is not morally justifiable to infringe on people's rights because of the failings of others. And number two, the media is not wrecking our children. It just isn't. Stop inciting stupid moral panics and going on ridiculous moral crusades because you have nothing fucking better to do. Ugh, done. Thank you.